How are you doing this morning? Great. Again, my name is Russ Miller. So I have a clicker in one hand and a microphone in the other. So if I start talking like this, just throw something at me, okay? Um, I want to say hello to uh, not only the folks here in Anthem, but everybody that's up in Prescott and also everybody that's across town in Gilbert. Good morning to all you guys. Um, I'm going to stand a little bit off to the side just so I can see what's behind me here. But I want to first start out by asking you guys uh, just a few questions. Hey, honestly, how many of you have heard or been taught that biblical creation is a religious belief? Well, right, everybody's taught that. It is a religious belief on how we came about. Let me ask you another question. How many of you have heard or been taught that millions of years of time leading to Darwinian evolution is science? How many of you have heard that? That's what they teach in our public schools and colleges, right? Well, then that brings me to a third question, because I'm confused now. Aren't creation and Darwinian evolution, aren't they exactly the same thing? Follow me on this. Aren't they both beliefs on how we came about? Oh, yeah. They're both religious beliefs on how we came about. Neither one is science. Science is knowledge derived from the study of evidence, and real science is a believer's best friend. Always has been, always will be. I'm going to show that to you this morning, um, but I, I guess I have to ask, well, what's going on? What's the story here? Well, you are involved in a world war. It's the greatest war in the history of the world. But it's not a war that involves bullets and nuclear-powered aircraft carriers and bombs. It's actually far more serious than that. But because it doesn't have these obvious things, a lot of people don't realize it's going on. It's subtle, yet totally devastating. You see, the, the wars that we can see might kill your body. This is the war for your eternal soul. This is the war for the eternal soul who, of anyone you know, anyone who's alive today, anyone who will ever live in the future, this is a war that's already claimed eternity for not millions, billions of people. And see, it's being played out today in a, a war of worldviews. Now, really, it's a war that started in the Garden of Eden. It's Satan versus God. But it's being played out today in a war of worldviews. The uh, secular or humanist uh, wor worldview, which is based on two religious beliefs, millions and billions of years of time, that's a belief. You have to believe in millions of years of time, leading to Darwinian evolutionism, which is a belief on how you came about without God, versus a biblical worldview that's based on a perfect creation, that was corrupted by Adam's sin that separated us from God, requiring our redemption through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These are two religious beliefs. So let's take a look at this. And that's not switching. So if you guys could get that going again in the back, I'd appreciate it. But <clears throat> I just would have been dancing with all that. So here we go. I got the thumbs up. Thank you, guys. Jesus said that Moses wrote of me. Hey, do you think it was important to Jesus what Moses had to say? On the day of his resurrection, well, who was the first person he started teaching his disciples from? Moses. Why is that? Well, see, through the inspiration of God, Moses is used to lay down the foundation of the gospel message in Genesis 1 and 3. I came up with an acronym, or I really feel God gave this to me, I call the cost. C-O-S and the cross. The cost this is where we're told in the first and the third chapters of the book of Genesis that God gave us a perfect creation. Try to, try to imagine that. It's, it's really, it's beyond human comprehension. It was perfect. You ever hear somebody, a lot of times scoffers, but sometimes well-meaning people will say, come on, how, how can we have a loving God in this world full of death and suffering? You ever hear something along those lines? Hey, if you leave here with nothing today, know how to biblically answer that. It's an extremely simple answer, but it's found right here in Genesis 1 and 3. Because this secular attack of billions of years leading to Darwinism, uh, most people have lost the biblical answer. Here it is. The answer is, well, God didn't give us the world the way it is today, full of death and suffering. You see, God gave us a perfect creation. What happened to it was Adam's original sin. You see, Adam's original sin allowed death to enter the creation and that's why we live in a world full of death and suffering, yet we have a loving God. 
pretty simple answer, right? And now you know it. You can share it with others. But you see, that original sin is more important from a Christian standpoint. Now, think about this. Adam walked in the garden with God. Well, why don't we walk in the garden with God today? Well, see, that original sin separated us from God. And that's what we deserve for eternity is to be separated from God. But our loving creator is so caring and loving toward us that despite our sin and and eternal separation, which is what we deserve, he sent his only begotten son to suffer and die on a cross so we could be redeemed with him for eternity. That is the foundation of the gospel message. That is a loving, caring God who, despite our sin, died in our place. He shed blood covering our sin, rose from the grave the third day to defeat death for eternity, and provided a way for us to spend eternity with him in heaven. It doesn't get much more loving than that. This is also why you see biblical creation under relentless assault from the other side. Remember, you are in a war, a war of world uh, views. Now, Moses also told us through the inspiration of God that God has judged man's sin once already with a flood of waters that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. <laughs> Come on now. I mean, we're going to be honest. With you. I was told I could be perfectly honest with you guys. Is that okay? Can, you'll, you'll be able to handle it, right? Okay. If God's word were really true. I mean, if there had been this flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven, that would be a global flood, right? Well, wouldn't the evidence be sort of overwhelming? I mean, there shouldn't be anything to even discuss or argue about if there had really been a global flood. I mean, what would you expect to find? it? I would think if there had really been this global flood, that the crust of the earth that we live on and walk on our entire lives, the crust would be made up of sedimentary layers of rock that have been stratified out by grain size, weight, and density by the moving water. You ever see a miner with a pan? He scoops up some uh, sediments and water, and he sloshes it back and forth. The moving water stratifies out the sediments by grain size, weight, and density. Well, on a global scale, a year-long global flood would have eroded the top two miles or so of sediments and then stratified them out and laid them back down separated by grain size, weight, and density. I mean, if, if, the, if the Bible were true, it should be obvious. And I'd expect those layers laid down in that year-long flood will be full of billions of dead things that were drowned and buried so quickly they couldn't rot away or get eaten by scavengers, if the Bible's really true. But what do we actually find today? Well, you see the uh, outer crust of the earth averages a mile deep of sedimentary layers of rock stratified out by grain size, weight, and density full of billions of dead things that we call fossils. Exactly what would be there if the Word of God were true. Oh, and my friends, the Word of God is true, word for word and cover to cover. But you see these uh, early chapters of Genesis under relentless attack today, don't you? Yeah, We've been sort of slow to pick up on this. You might be thinking, well, who cares about this? Well, think about this. Jesus said if you don't believe Moses, how will you be able to believe Jesus' words? Jesus thought it was vital. And again, on the day of his resurrection, he began teaching his disciples with Moses. Why, why would it be important today? Well, you see, the, uh, the humanistic or secular worldview, which is taught as if it were science, has been now for 55 years officially in our schools. Think about this. Their worldview is based on the exact same sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water. You know, think about it. People ask me all the time, hey, Russ, what evidence do you have the Bible's true? I always say, well, the exact same evidence that atheists use to say it's not true. Think about it. Don't we live in the same world? So don't we have exactly the same evidence? Yeah, it's never been about who has the evidence. It's about who gets to interpret the evidence. And you see, for the last 55 years, humanists and secularists, atheists, they have taken over the whole system. They, ta- they own the schools, universities, the media, Hollywood, etc., and they teach their religious interpretation of those strata layers in the place of science. And billions of people now think that it's science. But think about it. It's based on the same sedimentary layers. You just say, hey, those layers of rock stratified out by grain size, weight, and density didn't form in a flood. There was never a global flood. No, no, those layers formed slowly over millions and billions of years of time. This is where the old earth beliefs that are worshipped today come from. This was invented about 200 years ago. It's a relatively new invention, by the way. 
But you see, what this is teaching is that man evolved through billions of years of death and suffering. Wait a minute. The Bible says in the beginning God created the first five words of the Bible. Jesus says man was made male and female since the beginning. And the biblical message is man's sin allowed death to enter, corrupting the creation, separating us from God, requiring Jesus' death on the cross to redeem believers with him for eternity in heaven. But what we've been teaching our kids, anyone under the age of 70 now has been taught this as if it were science. What we've been teaching is, hey, kids, there was no perfect creation. There was no creator at all. There's certainly no original sin bringing in death. It was death that brought you in. Do you see that? They're teaching billions of years of death is the hero of the plot. Death is the hero. That's what brought you along. The Bible says the last enemy that will be destroyed when Jesus returns is death. Death is an enemy to God's creation. No wonder the Bible says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Hey, did you guys know that of the 200 or so branches of modern science, that over 160, more than 80% were started by creation-believing Christians to study God's creation? Did you know that? Think about this. The reason we have science today, modern science, is because of Christians. We thought, hey, you know something? We have this intelligent creator. He probably put some laws in place to govern his creation. And that's what started modern science. We would study the creation. Now they call it nature. And we could discover some of the principles God put in place to govern it. And we started discovering just two or three things. And now over the last 150 years, prideful man takes over and says, oh, there's no God. We know how a couple of things work. We don't even understand probably 99.999% of the universe, but we think we're real smart now and we're too smart for God. Well, anyways, there wouldn't be science without Christianity. Now, real science is the believer's best friend, has always been and still is today. Uh, real science is knowledge derived from the study of evidence. Things have to be there to study, to test, to observe, so the findings can be scientific. Real science, a believer's best friend, has led to microphones, penicillin, projectors, airplanes, space shuttles. Real science is a believer's best friend. False science is another issue. Now, this textbook tells kids um, <clears throat> evidence certifies the planet Earth is more than 4 billion years old. Well, wait a minute. Now, evidence certifies billions of years of death existed before man? Does evidence really certify that? I want to show you where the old earth beliefs come from, because they are the foundation of Darwinism, naturalism, humanism, modern atheism, etc. This is their whole foundation. This is everything to them. If they lose millions of years, they lose it all. Let me show you where the old earth beliefs are derived from, and you can decide for yourself this morning what you really want to put your faith in. You've probably heard of carbon dating. It's one of the more popular the isotope dating methods. It's used on organic remains. Now, during the process, well, I should say they measure the amount of carbon-14 in these remains. Carbon-14 is manufactured in the atmosphere. During the process of photosynthesis, plants breathe in CO2 that contain trace amounts of C14. So it becomes a part of the plant's tissue. When an animal eats a plant or breathes, they get C14 in them. We all have trace amounts of carbon-14 in us. Now, when a plant or an animal dies, it stops eating and breathing. At least that's always been my observation. And the carbon-14 decays away. In fact, the few scientists that deal with dating methods, remember there's about 200 branches of science. We probably have some scientists here today, but a lot of scientists will tell you scientists don't know everything. There's 200 branches of science. A scientist understands one half of 1% of science pretty well. But what I found, if you go to a scientist in one field, and ask them about their proof for Darwinism, they'll rarely say, we don't have any, but the other 199 have it. So you go to the next one, ask him, and it goes around this whole circle. Nobody has any evidence of Darwinism having taken place, but they all think everybody else has uh, the evidence. But carbon-14, at the rate it decays, should be gone in measurable amounts in about 80,000 years. So you can't carbon date something older than that because there wouldn't be any C14 left to measure. But follow me on this. Since it decays away over time, the less carbon-14 in an item, the older something's going to date, up to just a few thousand years, and the C-14 would be gone. Does that make sense? Seems reasonable. 
Except Science uh, Journal reported living penguins were dated 8,000 years old. Living snails dated 27,000 years old. It doesn't work. This from the Anthropological Journal of Canada. The troubles of carbon dating are undeniably deep and serious. There are gross discrepancies. Half the dates are thrown out, and the published dates that you get to see are actually selected dates. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Selected dates? You mean they, they just pick a date they want something to be? Yes. Well, where, where do they pick the date from? Where do the old Earth dates really come from if it's not from radiometric dating? They come from the man-made geologic column or time scale. This was invented about 200 years ago, and what they did was they made a drawing with 12 primary layers, and they assigned an age and gave names to each layer. Now, this was back when we thought a cell was just a glob of gelatin. So in our mind, we could think of how it might have just poof come about on its own. We now know the cell is way beyond human comprehension. The DNA, the molecular motors, there's no way it came about on its own. But 200 years ago, we didn't know about that. We didn't know about genetics and such. So where did they come up with the ages that they assigned to the layers 200 years ago? Where did the old Earth beliefs come from today? Where did they come up with the ages? They made them up. Where else could they have come up with them? And then they assigned index fossils to each layer. So th this is really the key to the old Earth beliefs. These creatures, like this fish, supposedly went extinct while this layer was forming. So he wouldn't be found in the layers above because he was what? He was extinct. So the index fossils are the key to the old earth dating methods. Let me show you from this textbook. On page 306, they tell kids we date the rock layer and everything in the rock layer by the index fossils found in it. They date the rock layer by the fossils. Okay, fair enough. But, um, hmm. Where did they come up with the age of the fossils? What well, says on page 307? We date the fossils by the rock layer they're found in. You date the rock layer by the fossils and the fossils by the rock layer. It's a total circular argument, all based on the geologic column. It's important to understand the columns where the date comes from. For instance, uh, this lobe fin fish was supposedly extinct for 325 million years, so anything found with a low fin fossil in it, and everything in the layer was dated up to 325 million years old. That's how the dating methods work. Do you see that? That's it's important to understand that the index fossils are the key here because they keep showing up alive today by the dozens. The low fin fish has been found alive today. Not extinct 325 million years. Huh, interesting. Now, I want to be as fair as possible. The other side owns a system. They only teach their, indoctrin their interpretation, so that's indoctrination. I want to give you both views. I look at that living low-fin fish, and I say that refutes the old Earth dating methods, which undermines Darwinism, humanism, atheism, etc. But you can look at the exact same evidence. You could also interpret it another way. You could say, no, it just proves that scuba diver is 325 million years old. You'll have to take your pick, which you want to believe. The, uh, the index fossils, which are the key to the old Earth dates, which are the foundation, again, of humanism, secularism, etc., they keep showing up alive today by the dozens. They're showing up alive today so often they had to come up with a scientific classification for them. They call them Lazarus Taxon because they've risen from the dead. But they never were extinct. We just hadn't discovered them yet. Showing up alive today by the dozens. And the column, which is the key to the uh, Old Earth dating methods, which is, again, the foundation for all these isms out there, it's only been found in the correct order of the 12 primary layers with the correct order of the corresponding index fossils two places in the entire world, school textbooks and museum displays. The column does not exist in the correct order anywhere I'm aware of. Now, again, I want to be as fair as possible. This is the foundation for the isms, and the, the diehards do claim it is found, think about this, they readily admit it's not found in 99.5% of the Earth's surface, but they claim it does exist in one half of 1%. Well, wait a minute, if the layers form slowly over millions of years, shouldn't it be there in 99.5% of the surface? And of the places I've checked out, a little piece here, a little piece there, they don't have the 12 correct layers with the corresponding index fossils. I know of nowhere it's even found in the real world. 
Think about this from American Journal of Science. Think about what this says. Radiometric dating would not have been feasible. It wouldn't work if the geologic column had not been there first. What does the man-made, non-existent geologic column have to do with radiometric dating? The radiometric dating techniques get a huge range. They had to pick a date that matches the column. So they really get the dates from the column, which is not found, who's not found anywhere in the world. And it's based on the belief there was never a global flood, making the global flood the linchpin in the war of worldviews. Think about this. Real science, a believer's best friend. Real science has found that carbon-14 exists in all the fossil-bearing layers down to the bottom of the Cambrian, which we're told is 600 million years old. Well, doesn't that prove that they can only be a few thousand years old? Oh, and better yet, it's in the same range of amount from the top layer all the way through the bottom, which means they had to form in the same event. And nothing but a global flood can explain that. Did you know that never has an oil deposit or a natural gas deposit or a coal layer been found that doesn't still contain carbon-14, which should be gone in just a few thousand years? Real science is a believer's best friend. Did you know in the last 20 years, more than 50 non-fossilized dinosaur bones have been found? Did you know this? They still contain red blood cells, amino acids, dinosaur DNA, and soft, flexible dinosaur tissues. Did you guys know this? Why isn't this front page news? Because the foundations of secularism, the old earth beliefs, are the belief there was never a global flood, the radiometric dating, the geologic column, where the radiometric dating picks their dates from based on there never having been a flood, dinosaurs and Grand Canyon. Those are the five pillars of secular beliefs. And we can take them all out given about 15 minutes. Only a global flood can explain this. You see, follow me on this. A global flood would explain how the strata form quickly, wiping out every old earth belief that puts death before Adam. Wow. Big time wow, right? Think about this. The Bible is the only book in the history of the world that lives on on its ability to correctly predict the future. Hundreds of prophecies have been made that have come true. The Bible is hundreds for hundreds. The handful left are shaping up right before our eyes today. You know, other religious texts all make prophecies, and maybe one out of ten will come through, and nine out of ten don't. The Bible is hundreds for hundreds. In fact, the Bible even says God tells us that's how you tell his word from false religions, is by the prophecies coming true. And one of the great prophecies in the New Testament in 2 Peter 3 is they'll come in the last days scoffers. You guys ever see a scoffer? And they're going to say all sorts of crazy things like, I won't believe the Bible unless you can scientifically prove it's true. Wow, I was at a church in California last Sunday. My wife, Joanna, was out at the resource table, and someone came up and said, I won't believe anything your husband says unless you can scientifically prove the Bible's true. She vaulted over the resource table, grabbed this guy in a headlock, started twisting his nose back and forth. There was a big commotion. I was running out there to see what's going on. She let the guy go, and he stood up. His nose was bleeding profusely. I said, Joanna, why would you do this to my nose? She said, well, son, I just wanted to prove to you the Bible scientifically correct because in Proverbs we're told the ringing of the nose will bring forth blood. <laughs> and you can scientifically, yeah, okay, I'm just joking about Joanna. She didn't do that. You might think about it sometimes, but you wouldn't actually do it. Okay, let's get back to that prophecy. These scoffers, the Bible says, are going to be willingly ignorant. They're going to choose to be ignorant that by the word of God, the world that was being overflowed with water perished. Think about this. This is an awesome prophecy. Given 2,000 years ago, we're told in the last days, scoffers would deny there was ever a global flood. Why would they care about the global flood? Because belief in the age of the earth comes down to how the strata layers form. If you believe in millions of years of time, you may have never thought about this, but you're taking the word of people who deny the flood. You see, the age of the earth depends on if the strata formed slowly over millions of years of death and suffering or quickly during a global flood. The global flood wipes out every old earth belief that puts death before Adam. The global flood is a linchpin, and the Bible foretold in the last days scoffers would deny the global flood exactly what secular geology does today. You know, some, um, just 
And this week, uh, kids all around the world are going to be taught, and this is a first grade textbook, Earth has changed much since it formed four and a half billion years ago. Based on the strata having formed slowly, putting death before Adam. You know, people ask me all the time, you know, what's the big difference here? I want you to realize the difference between Bible-based geology and secular-based geology, they're 98.5% exactly the same. The only difference is did the strata form in a global flood or did they form slowly over millions of years? Everything else is pretty much the same. You know, biology is not that much different either. I'll talk about biology here in a couple of minutes. But Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is likened to leaven, which represents sin, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. You see, a pinch of sin, a pinch of compromise with secular atheist beliefs can really leaven your whole belief system. They can totally change who you believe in and what you believe. You know, today, Christian colleges and schools and seminaries are full of teachings of, you know, trying to fit the millions of years of death and suffering into God's word. All that do this deny there was ever a global flood. They say it was what kind of a flood? A local flood. Why would they say it's a local flood? Because a global flood would wipe out the old earth beliefs. So as a Christian, why not just accept the global flood? Doesn't that seem to make sense? See, the gap, first thing, and all these were invented in the last 200 years after secularists invented the geologic column. So these don't come from the Bible. They come from trying to fit secular beliefs into the Bible. The gap theory was the first attempt. This is where uh, God had a different creation. I call it the non-biblical creation. And Satan and his minions messed it up so bad, he made the new creation. He destroyed the old creation and made the new creation and left it full of Satan and his minions? That doesn't make any sense. Um, theistic evolution, which I used to believe, uh, is that God used millions of years of death and suffering to slowly evolve us. Progressive creation, God used millions of years of death and suffering to slowly create us. They're basically the same thing. All these are wiped out, though, by a global flood. You see, here's the problem from a Christian standpoint. And this is the reason I think we, we're just, we just haven't really picked up on this. Now, the millions of years is everything to the other side. It's, it's everything. Uh, but to us, it's like, well, if God used six days or six billion years, who cares, right? Here's the problem. The old earth beliefs, here's where Adam comes along. The old earth beliefs put death before Adam. Once you've taught or accepted that death existed before Adam, you can't accept or teach that Adam's sin brought in death. See that? Separating us from God, requiring our redemption through Jesus. So that's the whole issue, and it's devastating. If the age of the earth is an issue for you, don't be ashamed. It, I don't see how anyone couldn't believe it. It's the only thing we're taught in our secular world. But our old earth global flood covers this. It covers Pangaea, continental drift, the ice age, uh, coal layer formation, and so much more. Um, and my book, The Cost, covers these things too. You know, again, one of the great prophecies. Now, this was given to the ancient Israelites in Jeremiah. We're told people are going to turn their back on God, saying to a stone, thou hast brought me forth. Now, today, we're far too advanced to believe we came from a stone, right? I mean, we would never sit back and let anyone teach us or our children or grandchildren they came from a stone, right? Right? Let's go to the modern textbook. Earth is thought, thought believed to have formed four and a half billion years ago, it started out as a big ball of hot rock. And oceans formed as it rained on the stone, the rock, for millions of years of time. We're teaching our children they came from a stone. Yeah, I have atheists come up to me all the time and get right in my face. I'm an atheist. Like, like, you know, like I'm supposed to get mad or something. I'm looking, I don't say this, but I'm looking at them thinking, well, that's your problem, not mine, you know. And, uh, but I usually, they'll say something like, oh, you believe your invisible God created the world. I just look them right back in the eye and say, you think we came from a wet rock. Think about this is what they believe. They don't realize it, though. But they believe next to nothing blew up the Big Bang. We're on like our fourth version of the Big Bang. The Big Bang, and after billions of years, this big rock formed, and it ran in the rock for millions of years, right? So they're sitting there at this wet, sterile rock. Where do they think we came from? They came, think we came from a wet rock. And usually when you point it out to them, it opens their eyes to the fact that they just might have been lied to. See, they think their position is real scientific, and actually it's, it's a ridiculous fairy tale. 
approve all things, hold fast that which is good. What about the scientific law of biogenesis? You know, real science, a believer's best friend. The law of biogenesis is that life only comes from life. You can't get life from non-life. So if they're sitting there at this wet, sterile rock, where did life come from? They have no way to get life started. Anyways, it's a huge problem for the other side, not for us whatsoever. And now at Northern Arizona University, I spoke there several times. In fact, it made such an impact, they started an accredited class attacking me personally and biblical creation that they ran for at least four years. I don't really pay much attention to what they're doing because they wouldn't let me come in and talk at the class, so they just closed the doors and slammed creation, Christianity. And for their final exam, they made fun of me for an hour and a half. Hey, I've been married 35 years. That's not going to bother me a bit. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I am just kidding. I'm kidding. Joanna's great, and she even lets me tell that joke. But this was the book they used in the class, Attacking Creation, written by one of the world's most outspoken atheists. That's her, her bias. Everybody has a bias, a religious belief. That's hers. And she's the president of the National Center of Science Education. So I thought, well, let's go to that book they use in this classroom in college text and see how they get over the law of biogenesis. And on page 26, it says the origin of life was a continuum of events with, well, uh, <clears throat> a lot of iffy stuff in the middle. That's the modern college textbook on how life started without God. I think maybe it's not quite such a scientific fact after all. Wow. Yeah, you can Google it if you don't believe me, right there on page 26. Well, this textbook tries to get around the scientific law of biogenesis. You know, real science, the believer's best friend. It tells kids, 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 all the many forms of life on earth today are descended, stated as a scientific fact are descended from a common ancestor found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms with a nice drawing above of this little organism and everything connected to it by nice, colorful lines. What more for proof could you want than orange lines, right? Well, wait a minute. What evidence they have? I mean, from the Big Bang to the Big Rock to the rain on the rock to the poof moment when life started to the common ancestor we all evolved from, what evidence do they have? Oh, it says right here. No traces of those events remain. It's a fairy tale. Now, they can own the system, and they can teach it all day long. What they can't do is provide any proof this ever happened. I thought science was knowledge derived from the study of evidence. See, it's not science. In fact, the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy, avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. Don't avoid real science. Real science is on your side. Real science is a believer's best friend. But watch out for false science, which some professing have erred in the faith. Erring in the faith is not a good place to be, my friends. This former Harvard professor and Nobel Prize winner stated, modern biologists, having reviewed the downfall of spontaneous generation, that's poof, life starting without God, yet unwilling to accept creation are left with nothing. They have nothing, but they own the entire system. And they keep teaching their ridiculous stories with no evidence to back it up as if it were science. Avoid science falsely so-called. So what they say is, well, if we just start out with the raw material to form life, life could form on its own, given enough time and a source of energy. Well, we can't get life to start from non-life even in laboratories when billions of dollars would be paid to anyone that could do it. We can't do it. But let's say, since we can't get life started, let's just say we had the raw material to form a brick building like this building. Let's say we had the brick and mortar. And so to give them time, we gave them a billion years. And a source of energy, we haul a brick and mortar up to the top of a five-story building. Then once per second for a billion years, we push off that brick and mortar. Once per second for a billion years, how many beautiful brick structures do we come up with? We get this every single time, don't we? But you just take that brick and mortar one time and throw in just some simple human intelligence. You get a beautiful structure every time. You see, the difference between intelligent design and naturalistic's random chance is immense. There's no comparison. Now, this hammer was found encased in rock. Now, if I told you the hammer was evolving from the rock, what would you think of me? You would think, call security, right? I mean, well, why? 
well, it shows too much design to have formed on its own, right? You would never believe that hammer came about on its own. Well, then why do we let them teach our children they came from a rock? You are hundreds of trillions of times more complex than a hammer. Why in the world do we sit back and let secular atheists teach our children they evolved from a wet rock on their own? Unbelievable. Mind-boggling. Have you ever heard that you're 98% the same in your biochemistry as a chimpanzee, proving we're close relatives to the chimps? You hear that one all the time, right? Now, real science, a believer's best friend, actually has as much as a 30% difference there. So why do they still teach a 2% difference? That's just lying. Hey, let me ask you a question. Why don't they just get rid of the frauds and the lies and just fill the textbooks with the real evidence of Darwinian evolutionism? Because it never happened. They don't have any evidence. I see it on college campuses. I see it loud. I see it clear. And I give the professors an hour to, to come up with something they can't. It never happened. In fact, if they're going to teach that similar biochemistry proves our evolutionary past, they should teach our kids they're evolving from worms. You're 75% the same in your biochemistry as some worms. Your biochemistry is 50% the same as that from a banana. Anyone evolved from a banana? Just two or three. That's not bad. Last time I was on a college campus, 500 students raised their hand when I asked that question, and they were serious because they've been taught we all evolved from a common ancestor, which would mean you are related to bananas. I got home that night. I got on the Internet. You know, you check your family tree. I checked my family tree. There wasn't a banana in the whole bunch. Didn't find that very appealing, huh? <laughs> You guys are the only ones that ever laughed at that last joke. Everyone else groans. I'm not sure if I'm happy or, or disappointed. I, honestly, not. Think about genetic information. You know, back in Darwin's day, we didn't know about this stuff. We just thought a soul was a glob of gelatin. You know, the best human technology only reads in one direction. We now know genetic information reads forwards, backwards, and we think diagonally. When you get home tonight, try to write a one-page, one page that can be read forwards, backwards, and diagonally and make sense. Try it. We can't do it. And that's what genetic information does. And we teach our kids that evolve from a wet rock? <laughs> really? Wow. One mathematician, a molecular biologist, calculated the odds of just one DNA chromosome arranging itself in a natural setting to be one in 10 to the 100 billionth power. Well, what kind of a number is that? Well, 1 in 10 to the 50th power is considered to be absolute zero. 1 in 10 to the 100 billionth. It would be like if you played the Arizona lottery, and I'm not saying you should, but if you did, your odds of winning the lottery every week, 52 weeks a year, for 27,000 years in a row would be mathematically better than one DNA chromosome forming on its own. Oh, and they don't need one. They need trillions to even seem viable, mind-boggling. This is an NAU textbook. They pick on me. I figured, hey, might as well pick on them. But there, it's no different. It's the same thing in high school textbooks. They show these nice drawings of the, the bones in the forearm of a human, the foreleg of a dog, a cat, a horse, or the flipper of a whale. And they say, look, there's two bones in the forelimb. Prove they come from a common ancestor. Now, remember, there's two ways to look at all evidence. Why don't they teach both? I say, isn't that proof they might just have the same designer? Hey, especially kids uh, that are still in school, high school or college, please remember, any argument of similarities, biochemistry, bone structure, is a better argument you have the same designer, not that you evolved from a wet rock. Yeah, I drive a Ford pickup truck. My next-door neighbor drives a Ford van, and their dashboards are identical. It's not because they evolved from a moped because they have the same designer, right? Similarities are proof of your biblical designer. If you understand the difference between micro and macro evolution, you'd win a, a debate anywhere in the world from Oxford to Stanford, anywhere in between, which is why Darwinists don't debate anymore, by the way. If you ask a biology professor to define the word evolution, they will refuse to do it. Wait a minute. In real science and engineering, don't we break things down to the millionth of a degree? Why will they refuse to break down the word evolution? Well, if they did, everyone would see there's never been any evidence of Darwinian macroevolution. 
If you ask me, hey, Russ, do you believe in evolution? I'd say, absolutely. Biblically correct microevolution. Let me, let me tell you the difference, and you'll, you'll see this clearly. Micro is just changes within the same kind of plants or animals, the same family, basically. Uh, you, you anyone have a pet dog? You can get it under the pound and get a pair of dogs, a male and a female. Mutts work the best. They have the whitest gene pool. And you start breeding dogs together and then taking puppies and with traits you like and breeding them together. You might, after 100 years, come up with all 350 types of dogs we have on Earth today. But they'll still be dogs. Dogs will only bring forth dogs. Plants and animals will only bring forth after their kind. There can be changes within the kind caused by the, thing about this, sorting or loss of the parent starting genetic information. Gene pools get weaker and weaker and weaker. Microevolution, a scientific fact. Darwinian macro change would be a dog producing a non-dog given, of course, millions and billions of years of time. Think about it. Since micro changes are caused by the loss of information, it makes Darwinism scientifically impossible. Here's how I show people how to destroy Darwinism in four seconds flat. Start your watch. Gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism impossible. Stop your watch. That's the reason they have no evidence. It never happened, which is why all their proofs, if you look in the textbooks, are drawings. There's an old saying that goes like this. Darwinists are experts at drawing things that never existed to support their theory that never took place. Yeah, truthfully, you take away their box of crayons, they are left with nothing. But they own the system. Why is it vital for Christians to understand it's a scientific fact, though, that kinds bring forth after the kind? It's the only thing that's ever seen, and it's seen in every experiment on this issue. Why is that important to understand? Because 10 times in the book of Genesis, we're told plants or animals will bring forth after their kind. And today, after millions of scientific experiments, that's all that is seen. So you might think, well, Russ, what about, uh, you know, what about the ape men? You know, we've seen the ape men. What about those hominids, the closest link between ape and man? And here's a new textbook, and it shows kids, humans, connected to worms and jellyfish and all sorts of things with a nice red line. What more for proof could you want than a nice red line, right? How about some fossil evidence? Let's look at some of the famous hominids that have really misled not millions, billions of people. Their first major messiah was Piltdown Man, and from about 1912 until the mid-1950s, Piltdown Man was the messiah for Darwinism. It misled billions of people. It misled so many people, we finally kicked creation and prayer out of our schools, started teaching our kids they evolved without God. And then in the mid-50s, it was proven these jokers had taken the skull cap of a human, the jawbone from an orangutan, filed them down so they fit together, acid-treated both sides, buried them in a rock quarry in Piltdown, England, waited two years, dug up Piltdown Man, and spent the rest of their lives as world-renowned Darwinists and misled billions of people. Wow, on a total fraud. Nebraska man was used as proof for Darwinism. All they found was a piece of a broken tooth. But from that broken tooth, they reconstructed Nebraska man, his family, even the tools they would have worked with. And then it was proven the tooth came from an extinct pig. Yeah, this is the real Nebraska man right here. <laughs> Your closest living relative, my friends. Now, Lucy's been the Messiah for Darwinism for about, oh, about 44 or 45 years now. All they found was about, oh, about half of a skeleton. But they said, well, we know it's an ape becoming human because the knee was slightly bigger than a normal ape's knee. Well, if you took the knee bone of everybody in here, the knee joints, they'd be different sizes. That didn't prove anything. They said, but the thigh bone, the femur, angled to the knee. And humans have angled thigh bones. That proves it's becoming a human. They, well, they kind of forgot to mention all tree-dwelling apes have angled femurs. They also forgot to mention the in question was found a mile away and 230 feet deeper in the strata layer. Yeah, if that was Lucy's knee, I want to see the airplane that hit that monkey. Must have been going right through the treetops, about 700 miles an hour, I figure. This from 1987. Anatomists have concluded Lucy and, and the other Australopithecus afarensis is the scientific name is not a link between ape and man and did not walk upright like a human. They hunched over, drug their knuckles on the ground. Also, they found other uh, fossils since they have curved fingers and toes so they can grab onto tree limbs. 
Yet here's a modern textbook with a nice drawing of Lucy with normal fingers and toes walking upright like a human and talking on a cell phone. What are the odds of that? Pure fraud, pure propaganda. But another really nice drawing, don't you think? Yeah. No wonder Jesus said, take heed that no man deceives you. You know, a review of Darwinism versus real science, a believer's best friend, will show us no one's ever seen anything Darwinian macro evolve. It's a scientific impossibility, gene depletion plus natural selection. The fossil record shows no transitional forms that hold up to true scientific scrutiny. You know, we have 200 uh, classified species on Earth without a single half this, half that in between any of them. And a global flood erodes the old Earth beliefs. You know, if Darwinism is an issue for you, I cover this in good, really good detail. A lot more of the frauds in our science versus Darwinism. That was what caused NAU to launch the class. Caused one biology teacher to become a Christian, quit her job, and she now teaches science in a Christian school. Because real science is a believer's best friend. Nice drawings, though, don't you think? Wow. Here's an email I got. I spoke in Grand Rapids, Michigan, a couple years ago. And a local college sent 50 of their science honor students there to harass me. And I did our science and Darwinism. I walked off the stage, barely got behind the curtains. Three of their students came running up the steps right in my face. This one young woman said, I hold an advanced degree in biology and came here to debate you about Darwinism. And you just showed me everything I'm being taught is based on a lie. I said, well, praise God. Go back and tell your professors to stop teaching lies. Become real teachers. That didn't seem to go over too well. But my friends, um, the purpose of our ministry is to teach about creation, evolution, and age of the earth issues. You know, the majority of Christian kids now leave the church by the age of 20. You know why? They're being taught the Bible's not true, that they evolved through millions of years of death and suffering. Some people say, why do we talk about this in church? Because we're losing 90% of our kids. That's why. We win if we look at real science. Real science is our best friend. Real science. And there's not that much science involved. Like I said, it's only about 1% to 2% of what's taught in geology and biology. We cover this through our 14 messages, our, our Grand Canyon uh, interviews, and our Grand Canyon video that won Grand Runner-Up at the Independent Christian Film Festival, and much more. Our 50 top answer, uh, frequently asked questions and more are in our DVDs. About three or four things on all the singles are all in our DVD set. I don't copyright my DVDs. I tell people, make all the copies you want. Give them out to people. Tell them to make copies. There's people around the country that their whole ministry is giving away literally hundreds of videos each month. I cover these through uh, my book, The Cost. I cover the top ten old earth beliefs, top ten evil fruit of old earth beliefs, which includes Darwinism. I cover the top ten Darwinian beliefs, top ten proofs of the global flood. Really easy. If you want to really see, read something that is really easy to grasp, that's the book for you. I try to make break things down to where I, it's almost so uh, brief in some places, I probably could have added a couple of sentences. And through our uh, coloring books with a lot of information for kids on Noah's Ark and dinosaurs and our American Christian heritage endowed by their creator. Hey, do you know as an American citizen, you know where your freedoms come from, don't you? You're endowed by your creator with certain inalienable rights. And we've been teaching the last 55 years of our citizens there's no creator. Give that some thought. If you wonder what in the world's going on in our society today, that's your answer right there. Have you ever heard you don't believe in millions of years leading to Darwinism or anti-science? I want to point one thing out real quickly. We, had, we taught biblical creation and had daily prayer to God in our schools from the 1600s through the 1700s through the 1800s all the way through 1962. And in 1962, our nation was number one in the world in science, math, engineering, economy, manufacturing, military power, standard of living, etc. And then we kicked creation and prayer out of our school just 55 years ago and started teaching our kids they evolved without God. Here we are just 55 years later. How are we doing? Read Romans 1 today. Romans 1, 15 to 32. It'll take you two minutes. And think about 1963 when we kicked creation and prayer. Romans 1, 15 to 32. It will blow you away. God is in total and complete control. This textbook teaches kids we, that Grand Canyon was dug out by the Colorado River over millions of years of time. Who saw that happen? Hey, do you know Grand Canyon, we're going to uh, do a tour there on July 7th. 
kind of wondering about the temperature. It's going to be about 20 to 25 degrees cooler than it is here. You're at 7,500 foot elevation on the South Rim. What they won't tell you at Grand Canyon, and most people don't realize this, is you're actually on the upwork. The whole area, over a mile and a half of strata, was removed from above the rim, and the whole area uplifted. The Grand Canyon cuts through the upwork. It cuts through the upwork. It doesn't cut into the plain. It cuts through the uplifted area. It's a direct result of the late flood. See that butte right behind my head there? That's a 900-foot butte God left at the south entrance of the, of the 9,000 feet that used to exist above the rim. 9,000 feet of strata, 9,000 feet deep, removed from the area. Used to be above the Prescott area. Used to be 11,000 feet above the Phoenix and Gilbert areas. Above where you're sitting right now, 11,000 feet deep. You hear the Mogollon Rim? That's a 2,000-foot step that you pick up going north. And you pick this up at Bryce and Zion. I'll explain that on, on July 7th. But when I, I take folks to Grand Canyon, how many of you have been to the canyon? What did you think when you first saw where the original creation rock was? Wasn't that an awesome moment? Oh, nobody pointed that out to you. What did you think when you first realized where the first of the flood layers, the judgment layers, lay right on top of the creation rock, where creation met judgment? Wasn't that awesome? Nobody told you about that. Nobody told you about the missing mile plus of strata, did they? There's a lot of things they won't tell you there because, see, there's no way to explain it but global flood. And that's what we're going to show you on July 7th. We're going to show you the truth of God's word and, and in things you can physically take family and friends and show them in the future word for word and cover to cover. I mean, ask yourself honestly, if rivers carve out huge canyons over millions of years and if the earth is billions of years old, why isn't every river, gully, stream, and creek in its own Grand Canyon by now? It took a very set of, special set of circumstances to form the canyon toward the end of the flood. And I'll explain that in July. So I hope you guys will join us. Let me end with this. The book of John starts out, in the beginning was the Word, and all things were made by Him. So the Word of God is our Creator. Do you see that? The Creator is the Word of God. And the Word of God, our Creator, was made flesh and dwelt among us. So the Word of God, our Creator, is who? Jesus. Jesus is not only your Savior. He's your Creator, which gave Him the right to become your Savior. Now, so Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, Jesus also called himself the bread of life. So he's the word of God and he's the bread of life. But when tempted by Satan, he told Satan, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word from the mouth of God. And my friends, that means word for word and cover to cover, including the first five words of the Bible, which read, in the beginning, God created. My friends, you can believe those first five words, although they're under relentless attack today. Put your faith in the Word of God. Put your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me end my part with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, for this day and for every dear soul that's here today and also in, in Gilbert and in Prescott. And I hope and I pray the information we've shared will be eye-opening, even challenging to some, but will lead us to put our faith in you and stay on that narrow path that leads to that straight gate into heaven for eternity with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his great name I do pray. Amen. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Russ, thank you so very much. And you can tell that Russ has only really, really, really just touched the surface of this. And I really hope that you consider greatly coming to Grand Canyon. But Regardless of what you do, what we need to understand is that God calls us all to be apologetics, apologists. Did you know that? Did you know that God called every one of you to be an apologist? Let me read you something. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense. That word is apologia before you now. And when they heard that, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language. They kept Eve all the more silent. That's in Acts. And then in Philippians, it says, this is my defense to those who would examine me. That is also apologia. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others will preach from goodwill. 
It is uh, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am here for the defense of the gospel. Apologia. Over the last four weeks, we have been in an apologetic series. We have done this in Anthem. We have done it in Prescott, in Gilbert, in our online community. We've closed this series with this important message. Why? Because the Bible is important. And if the Bible is dismantled by beliefs that are taught in our public school systems over the last 55 years, we cannot defend the faith. And we are called to defend our faith, to be able to understand it. This is why it's important for you and I to disciple ourselves, to become disciples and not just decision makers. God did not call us to be dis- just decision makers and say, oh, yes, I'm a, I'm a Sunday Christian and I love the hallelujah. I am all about an engaging, inspiring worship service. But I want to tell you, if you leave our church and you go into your world Monday through Saturday and you're not equipped with apologia to be able to defend the word, I'm telling you, we have failed you. And over these last four weeks, I hope Gilbert, Prescott, Anthem, online, I hope you have sensed the importance that we have placed. Jesus is Lord. Amen? Jesus is Lord of all things. And yes, there is evil in this world, and this is why bad things happen. But this Bible is not a fiction. It is truth. And the reason we put these sermons in this particular order and had Russ Miller come at the very end was because what Russ Miller says to you takes everything that our schools have taught our children. I want to tell you, the young adult problem we have today is exactly because of this. They have some hard questions and Listen, I, for one, want us to be able to answer them. I have grandchildren that are young adults, and I want to be able to answer the questions they have, and I don't want them to be afraid to ask their questions. I want every question of every young adult that sits in our communities and in our homes to be able to have answers. And as our children come up and they are in these schools that are teaching this, I want us to be able to have answers. We have the privilege of carrying the gospel message, of being able to carry the message into our schools, into our workplaces, into our neighborhoods, into our communities. We have been called by God to be a lighthouse church. I want to tell you, you cannot accomplish that what God has called you to do, Grace North Church, if we don't understand that in the beginning, God created In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God spoke it into existence. We did not evolve from a rock. Thank you, Russ Miller. Thank you for bringing to light. And I am so inspired by your work, so inspired by your ministry. In a moment, church, we are going to worship the Lord for just a few moments in closing here. But I would like to ask Russ if you could stand here with me and Pastor Jeff and Jessica, if you could come to the platform. I want our church family to extend our hands and pray over this man. I want us to pray because, listen, it is the word of God that he is defending in his work. And he is teaching believers, come on up here. He is teaching believers what you just heard today. Listen, believers are struggling with this. Believers are telling us, oh, no, I believe in creation. I just believe in old earth. And many churches are not willing to stand and say, wait a minute, let me tell you the truth. I want us to know that knowing the truth is what will set us free. So would you extend your hands? And Pastor Jeff, if you would pray over Russ, I would so greatly appreciate it. And then church, we're going to enter into a 
time of worship. Church here and all over in Anthem and uh, in Prescott and Gilbert, could we just stand to our feet and extend our hands to this man? Have you been blessed by this ministry today? Amen. Amen. Russ, we so greatly appreciate you, but we want to empower you and pray over you publicly. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for this morning. We thank you for Russ and his ministry and um, just for being with us this morning and, and creating in us new truth, in some cases creating in us new faith, creating in us um, uncovered faith that maybe was laying dormant. And Lord, that's my prayer going forward in, in this ministry is that each audience that he has, whether it's an audience of one or hundreds, whether it's a receptive audience or one that's there to, to belittle or criticize, that, that faith will be unearthed, um, that, that, that faith will, will be restored in some, that faith will be kindled in others, that faith what, that was never there will be sparked in the name of Jesus. And with this, this topic that is so entertaining and vastly uh, beyond all of our minds, and yet it's so intriguing that it, it that it captivates the audience. I thank you for it. I thank you for his studies, for his history with it, for his experience, and, and being able to speak intelligently and spiritually and wisely to an audience that needs to hear it. And I pray for each audience to come that they will hear it. They will have ears to hear in the name of Jesus. They will have ears to hear truth truth that can answer questions, but more importantly, truth that can set them free. Truth that can put them into the camp of those that will see the truth one day in heaven and just be able to believe it now. We thank you for this. We thank you for Russ, for his wife, for their ministry. We thank you for this morning. And we give you glory, God, for making a great earth that was perfect and a great earth that will be perfect once again. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, you can purchase his products and books at creation. What is it? Creationscience.org. Creationscsm. Did I say that right? Yeah, our website's creationministries.org. I want to tell you a little backstory here, and Russ will be available at his here in Anthem to answer questions over at the product table. I want to tell you a backstory. I see Christy Luke's in the back over here. I believe it was early in February that Christy came and sat with me and Pastor Jessica and Alyssa and presented to us a prophetic vision she had for what became the story. For what became a beautiful, amazing production on Easter Sunday. What she didn't know at the very moment that she was presenting it to us was that we had already determined what the four weeks after Easter would be. That there would be an apologetic series that would rock our world. We knew that April 1st was Easter Sunday, April Fool's Day. And how fitting is that because so many people have been fooled for 55 years in America. And when she began to unpack, we knew that the story was the direction we would go. She even said to us, I, I'm not sure how to say this, but maybe it's like um, an apologetics. And Jessica and I just looked at each other. And I want to tell you that what God has done in these last five weeks, from Easter till now, has been he's stirring our hearts. He's raising up an army. He's raising up a, 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 an army of warriors to be the, the feet on the ground. He's putting the boots on the ground in our communities. As we begin and have this few moments together, collectively, I want you to know, Prescott, we're worshiping with you. I know it's complicated. I know you got a TV monitor. I know you got a screen and darkened windows. I get what you're dealing with. But would you press past that, Prescott, and worship with us for just a few moments? Gilbert, 
would you press with us? And just for just for just three or four minutes, I want to end in a time of praise and worship and thanking God and thanking our Creator for these five weeks. Amen. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. You're hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful What a wonderful name. What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. And all the angels shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Can you call him your creator today? You are our creator, and we praise you. Come on, church. We praise the creator of heavens and earth. We praise you, O oh God, our creator, and we thank you, Lord. We praise your holy name. Now, church, we're going to end our service, but if anyone here or in our Prescott or Gilbert campus needs prayer, we have some people that will always be willing to pray with you. If you're here today in one of our services in, all, in one of these three locations or online and you want to give your life to Jesus, the creator, the master craftsman, we would love to speak with you. We would love to talk with you. God bless you. We're going to close the service. I think some of them are wanting to worship a little longer here in Anthem. 
So if you want to worship with us a little longer, we want to release you officially. Have a very blessed day. If you have kids and kids' ministries, would you pick up your kids? God bless you and have a very blessed day.